is that that relaxation and that swing if you if you leave them to their own they will breathe in the rhythm of their steps in a comfortable deep way and and we want to pay attention to that because it's an indication of relaxation so that's uh responding to things that are happening so this is a uh again from the german and F, the principles of riding, and the dressage seat. The seat should rest in the lowest part of the saddle. The weight of the body should be equally distributed over the two halves of the seat, your butt, and the inside thigh muscles. The muscles should be free from tension. Any tension in the seat or thigh muscles will cause the rider to lever himself out of the deepest point of the saddle and sit above the horse. Only if he or she has a balanced supple seat will the rider's aids be correct. And even experienced riders should never stop working on their seat. So the above is quoted from the principles of riding. And that's a, I think it's a good place to start. It's a little bit of a review about what we talked about last week, about the two-point versus the three-point seat. And just giving you, again, that idea about sitting deep is a relaxed, supple seat. It's not a pushing or tight or gripping seat. So some points that we'll talk about. We need to develop relaxation before strength. So this goes for our riding, just like what we're talking about with the horses, right? When we talk about the training pyramid, we talk about building up the horse's rhythm and relaxation first. And then as we get that and we build up the connection, then we start with the... Um, impulsion so for us it's the same thing we need to build up our relaxation before we try to be strong about the way we ride we must become aware of our reactions to stress and then we have to work with ourselves we have to teach ourselves to control these reactions and a lot of this is going to be really helped by breathing and the breathing techniques that you can do, you don't only have to do when you're riding. You can make them a habit during other times of your day. And then it will follow through and help you to find that relaxation when you're riding. So if there, you practice breathing and you're meditating, practice breathing when you're doing other things, notice your breathing when you're tensed about something else in your day and then work to breathe through that tension that will help you when you're riding have an appropriate having an appropriate horse will help to develop the seat faster and without complications so if you have a horse that's a little bit tense if you have a horse that overreacts if you have a horse that's crooked of course the time it takes you to develop your seat correctly is going to be a little bit longer and you're going to need people on the ground to help you with that the that you stay relaxed that, that you're training the horse as you go along awareness is a double-edged sword we've talked about that before take time quietly notice the reactions and slowly replace them with better ones do not let your emotions take over when mistakes are coming up. Make time every week to prioritize seat work. Work on your body outside of riding time to improve the suppleness and awareness. Have fun. The best way to find relaxation is through joy and gratitude. So sometimes working hard, trying hard doesn't always get us what we want. So make sure that we always approach every lesson 
with gratitude that we even can ride horses, grateful to our horse for letting us ride them, and then try to find a little bit of joy in all of the ride. And catch yourself if you start to get more serious. And then safety is imperative. So it's important to learn the safety seat so that you have a way to stay in the saddle when things start to go wrong. So I prefer that you learn and get comfortable with the safety seat. You can even practice it a little bit throughout the ride so that you don't have to feel like you're riding on the parking brake all the time. So this, what we're talking about, moving with the horse, opening up our upper leg, letting our seat down in the saddle, not riding in that guarded place all the time, help, it, it, it creates vulnerability. You feel like you're not as in control as you are when you're a little bit gripping and holding on. If you know that you can have a safety seat, if something goes wrong, that will help you to be able to relax while you're working on your seat. The safety seat is heels well down, foot really planted in that stirrup. So you really feel that, that ball of your foot across the stirrup very well. And then you've got your heel really down. You're really feeling that secure base. You put your knee in the knee block a little bit hard if you need to. This way, the horses don't feel you gripping or adding energy to something that they're doing there where they're already a little bit upset. You want to keep your balance over the center of gravity. If you lose your balance backwards or side to side, then that's going to upset the horse even more. So you're thinking about keeping your balance with your safety seat without adding influence with your legs or with your seat. The, if you're gripping with your lower leg, you're adding momentum. If you're gripping with your upper leg, you're tensing the horse's back. If you're losing your balance, you could be holding back on the reins, driving the horse through the reins. So you want to work at keeping that balance down between your belly button and your lower back and over the center of the saddle. If the horse is moving fast, so we had to take a safety seat because our horse took off. You want to turn with one rein. Two reins are your enemy. One rein, just get the horse turning. Pick one side or the other and don't give up. If you're um, if the horse is bucking, then you're you're gonna have that safety seat and then you're gonna pull the head up. And if it's rearing, hopefully not, but you're rearing often comes because you're pushing at the horse, but it doesn't feel like it can go forward. So if that's happening, you're going to, again, look to balance yourself in your stirrups and in your knees, but don't add momentum. Everybody thinks when their horse is standing up that they have to push it forward, but for some reason, there's a mental block and the horse feels like it can't go. So take the pressure off, get uh, whether you can turn in a circle or, you know, get some kind of a leg yielding going and then, but that straight on pushing when a horse is really blocked in the withers and in the neck and in the mouth is going to get the, the, you know, if you have misunderstanding, whatever you put energy into, you're going to get more of it. So if the horse is misunderstanding and it's, you know, jumping a little bit up and back, and then you're putting more energy into that, you're going to get a little more of that. Okay. So that I wanted to talk about those, those things first. You're, we're looking to find relaxation and suppleness in our seat, moving with the horse. But of course, why do we grip? 
Why do we hold on? Is because we think that something bad is going to happen. We lose our balance or we lose trust. So knowing that we have a plan, if stuff starts to go wrong, we're going to put the knee in the knee block. We're going to put those heels down hard. We're really going to feel our feet down there. And we're going to plan on staying in the middle of the saddle so that our rain aids are going to work for us. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay. So now we will talk about the reason for our stress. So the psoas, we can look at the picture first, is this muscle that holds our lower back and our hips and everything together. And this muscle is responsible for a lot of things. It's known as the fight or flight muscle. And it connects our lumbar spine to our inner thighs by running through our hip joint. So a lot of times we talk about being, hey, Meg, we talk about being tight in the hips and we want to work at getting our hips more open and our hips more fluent. But this psoas can be part of that scenario. And the connection between our back and our legs enables us to run and kick these are two of the primary functions that we need in fight or flight mode it's also the connection that can grip us onto the saddle when our horse misbehaves or we feel a movement is getting out of our control so the nervousness that we build up when we're riding doesn't always have to be because we're nervous about falling off or we're nervous about our horse doing something bad or dangerous. Sometimes that nervousness can be simply about making mistakes or what people think or that we're not doing a good enough job or even that we can't stay with the movement as our horse starts to move bigger or more correctly or um or you know taking off in a little bit of a big movement without permission sometimes those things can make us nervous and that so as takes over and tries to control things when our nervous system senses that we are in danger it alerts our so as to fire up. This enables us to be ready to run away, whether it's from a lion that's chasing us um, or to fight off another predator that might be more of our match. In, it might be, um, in our case, about holding onto the saddle. So controlling our horse so that it doesn't make a mistake, so that it doesn't fall off the rail, so that it's making a proper flying change, so that the leg yield doesn't get out of control. It's, um, it might be because our horse is misbehaving that we all of a sudden clamp this down. But that clamping down feeling is not what the horse wants to feel. The horse wants to feel us supple and going moving with their movement with that natural movement and then that we're communicating with a well well balanced aids to um direct that natural movement that they have the neural connection between our brain and our muscles is a two-way street so when the psoas says okay something bad is happening um 
or the brain tells the psoas something bad is happening, you need to go to work. The psoas also is telling the brain that something is going wrong. And this is all happening without our permission. And then a lot of adrenaline can be pumped into your system from this psoas reaction. Okay, so you know that feeling when your horse does something a little bit um, spooks or does something that you weren't expecting and then you, everything is fine. You stay with it, you're fine, but all of a sudden your body doesn't feel the same anymore. You know, you, you can be a little shaky or you can simply just feel like the blood run out of your face. you you might feel that, that feeling of, um, butterflies, that, that adrenaline gives and also cortisol can um, participate in that. And it, it changes your perception. It can change how movement feels and it can also change how, uh, how you feel as you're covering ground, for instance, how, how your space is that anytime you have this influx of hormones, especially when they're all of a sudden dumped into your system, your environment is going to feel different. It's going to seem different. So it takes a lot of practice to talk your body out of having that response and to not respond like your horse is going to do that again because it happens once in a ride okay and so we you need to practice you need to practice noticing during your day if you're driving your car and all of a sudden you have to stop all of a sudden at a, a traffic light or somebody pulls out in front of you or you have some something that you see that doesn't even involve you but what happens to your body chemistry? And can I talk myself into breathing through it, relaxing my muscles, not letting my lower back get all tensed up? And you practice it. it it's not only when you're riding that these things happen. And so you can practice other times. The psoas is also very important as it's a primary muscle involved in stability and balance. So this what keeps you upright and it's what helps to keep your weight equal on your feet or keeps you from tipping over forward, backward, side to side. So if you think about that, when we're riding and we don't have any rain weight, and we're just riding on a long rein. Everything feels very easy. It, I, I think that, you know, all of us here can ride with a loose rein and keep ourselves balanced up on top of our horses. But something happens when we put those reins in our hand and then the horse might lose the balance or start not to do what we want. And then all of a sudden you feel like your seat is stuck to your hands. And so then we're taught we have to ride with our hands independently from our seat. And so your lower back and that psoas who is responsible when we're on the ground for balance starts to go to extra work. And that can be helpful when we control it correctly. And it can be really not helpful when it takes over the job and is holding in a tense way and our horse can't move properly underneath us. Is this making sense? Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> okay. So if you look at it again, you know, we talk about moving our hips with the horse's back. We're talking about uh, 
trying to keep that lower back, the tailbone a little bit tucked under, keeping that lower back a little bit more relaxed than we're taught in everyday life. And when we're riding and you want to sit upright, we're all taught to when we're standing upright, you arch your back a little bit and you open your chest. So this is something that we need to work on all day long is just bringing that belly button in a little bit, bringing your tailbone under a little bit, which is much healthier anyway for your lower back. And in that movement, it's going to give that relaxation to your hips naturally. But when we arch our back, then we're cranking those hips a little bit tighter than we want to be for riding. For the horse, when we are cranking on that, um, whether we're arching our back, clamping a little bit our hips and our legs, that they feel that in their back, okay? So we're trying to invite, in dressage, we're trying to invite the back to come up to the saddle, come up to our seat. And then in any case, no matter what level, you want the back to be moving a little bit under the saddle. So if we get tight, then we're actually closing up. They need to expand out into us. And we want to be careful not to be squeezing when they're trying to expand because that'll restrict that. And you see it a lot. You see it a lot where horses can't walk. You know, they, they start pacing in the walk. They're um, their backs are not moving and just the legs are moving. And this is all um, coming from this little bit of misunderstanding that we have with our uh, hips and our lower back. The issue when we are dealing with stress, so the stressed psoas, when we're making mistakes or hat riding spooky horses is that psoas is often in a constant state of flexion or activation. When we have had a bad experience, our nervous system is hypervigilant, wants to make sure that we don't get hurt. Nothing like that is gonna happen to us again. So our brain and our muscles are in a constant state of ready or activation in order to help us survive. Our nervous system does not have a rational way of thinking. So this is going back to us prior to how our lives are now. And a lot of people talk about the stress levels that we have, whether it's from work or school or, you know, you're just your daily relationships and how our that old brain is reacting and never able to kind of get out of that stressed state. And what they're talking about here, what we're talking about here is how it, your, your body, if it starts to feel something similar to what it's felt when something went wrong, it will respond without you telling it to. You're, you don't need to be saying, hey, you know, my ho your, the horse is going to take off. I can feel it underneath, you know, get ready where something is going to happen. Your body is already responding way before. And so sometimes the horse will give just a small feeling of uncertainty our bodies will activate into tension and then that will cause an escalation. So we have to teach ourselves not to overreact on every little thing that the horses do, whether it's a mistake, you know, just simply a mistake of, you know, losing a little bit the angle in a, in a lateral movement or losing the rhythm in a medium trot or something like that. Or if it is actually a little spook or something like that. And then we have to try to get ourselves back into that neutral 
place and moving with the horse as quickly as possible so that the horses feel relaxed and comfortable underneath us. The, um, your nervous system doesn't always know how to differentiate if this we're talking about the stress of traffic or kids or work um, or the horse simply going a little bit more forward. It only knows how to say, hey, we have to fix this or it's okay and we can go with it and we have to teach it that hey it's okay we can go with this we can we have it's a absolutely split second reaction that happens we are not in as in control of it as we would like to be and especially not if we've had a couple of bad experiences and your body you it's like a constant um work especially when you have a bad experience to get back to where you were before where you weren't re responding that way you have to consciously work at that so if you've had an experience where your horse took off was book bucking or spooking or and your brain logged in this experience into its subconscious when the same feeling happens again your body is going to respond, it go into that flight or fright mode where all of a sudden your psoas muscle is um, clamping down. The other thing about the psoas is that it hooks in by your diaphragm here into the lower back the same. So when it is in that flight or fright, you are not breathing as deeply into your center as normal. And a lot of people, when they are in show stress or some, some performance stress, don't breathe deeply and your body doesn't like the feeling of being shorted from that oxygen intake so it that also will get a bad response so the two things work together if your psoas is getting tense you're not able to breathe as deep as you want to if you're not breathing as deep just simply because you're a little bit nervous that's going to cause your psoas to get tensed because your body is saying something is wrong. I'm not getting the oxygen I need or getting rid of what I need to as well. So when we're taking short breaths, as opposed to long, slow breaths, our body is in a constant state of sympathetic arousal or fight or flight. We cannot have both sympathetic and parasympathetic which is the rest system working at the same time. One is taking over or the other. And so we need to practice this. In order for us to ride relaxed and engaged, we need to breathe. There's a huge amount of stress connect created from a body that uh, is doing physical uh, exercise without breathing. And this is something that's super interesting um, for me, because when I was younger in school, I didn't breathe well when we were playing sports and nobody ever taught me. It took me a long time to realize like long distance running and things like that. I really felt like I simply wasn't good at it or um, I was even defective, but it was that I would get nervous and I would breathe only up in here. And after a while, my body would simply tank. And then the same thing happens can happen when you're riding. If you're riding a dressage test or you're just even riding in a lesson and you get a little tensed in the lesson and then you don't breathe, you feel like you get tired sooner. Your body gets a little bit tighter. Your, um, your mate, you might start, start making mista uncharacteristic mistakes because you're breathing up here instead of down into your um, 
diaphragm. And the other thing that we learned over the winter is you want to think a little bit about pushing out into the lower back when you're breathing, not just that your belly is coming out, so that you're you're really filling up that uh, lower part of your body with your breath is the most healthy. And the um, other interesting thing is that horses have their lungs right underneath us. So I made the little picture so that you got, you can see that when if we are gripping on them, we can also be distorting how they are able to expand and relax their rib cage in their breath. And breathing is really important for horses. That that relaxation and that swing, if you if you leave them to their own, they will breathe in the rhythm of their steps in a comfortable, deep way. And and we want to pay attention to that because it's an indication of relaxation. So that's um, another reason why we want to stay relaxed and in control of our psoas so that we can help them to be able to expand out in the rib cage and, and expand out into our saddle, out into the saddle, out into our, our body. And they, they find us. And because of that, you feel confident and you feel comfortable. They're not disappearing from us. They actually come out and look for us rather than getting smaller and getting lower. They'll start to get more relaxed and open up into our position. So does anybody have any questions about that? The um, So I have, oh, wait, wait, I went to the wrong page. I have some exercises. Here we go. That... And that, that also all the ones that we did a couple of weeks ago, we did that whole um, thing on stretches that are really good for riding. And all of those are really targeting also your, your hips and your opening up your lower back. And the um, easiest one and the nicest one is the child's pose. Everybody knows that from yoga, but um that is a really good way to open up your lower back and to let that psoas just relax, those hips relax. If that's too tight, you can um, lift your butt up and put something under it. And you can even put your hands behind you and, and give a little bit of pressure to hold yourself up if you feel like this is putting too much pressure down on your hips. Hopefully this kind of a posture would become comfortable for you over time. And then the, um, this one is a little bit small. Hold on. But we talked about the open, um, bringing the knees one at a time to the chest. And you're going to keep your shoulder blades really wide and open on the, on the mat if you can. And feel your lower back kind of coming into the mat as you bring your knee down. And if if you feel stress on your lower back, then if you don't bring your knee as far, it's more important that you get that release in your hip and in your lower back. And you can do one knee at a time. And then of course you can always do um, both knees at the same time but you don't want to strain your knees. It's a, it's more about, you know, finding that relaxation, letting go in the hips and, um, and opening up in your lower back. And then I will also roll on the mat, um, to get, to get a little bit more relaxation in my lower back. So you can come, you know, up on your knees and hold your knees with your arms wrapped around. 
and then roll backwards and roll forwards on your back and feel it step by step, the vertebrae all rolling along the mat. And that can be really relaxing. And in the beginning, you might find that you have a little flat spot in your lower back and you want to try to work that out. That'll show you the places where you're a little bit tight or where those muscles might be gripping in uh, beside your vertebrae. And then these ones are at the bottom. Um, if you really feel like you get yourself a little bit more stuck, then you can use your pillows to open your hips. You can find that um, sometimes closing your knees on something can help you to release the muscles in your lower back and those that psoas in your hips and do that first and then do one of the ones up against the wall because um, oftentimes that, that bringing the pressure in, you kind of bring it in and then open it up. And that brings more awareness. It's very hard to talk your body into just relaxing, but sometimes if you tense something up, you make it a little bit strong and then you relax it, you can really feel that give. So all of these are really good for um, opening up your lower back, relaxing those hips and getting that, that whole sling there to let go a little bit. So I hope that helps. And you know, I'll send all of this to you. So the, I find that there are certain things that the horses will do that will elicit certain changes in your posture while you're riding. And just as a rider, you want to start to become aware of those things. When you're working on developing your deep seat with and, and letting a little bit go of the gripping, I, I, I like to think of that visual that my stomach muscles, my belly button is helping to hold my lower back and my tailbone closer to the saddle rather than my thighs or my hips. So when, and, and that kind of tunes you into your core more. And then when you're doing that and you're trying to stay open and sitting deep, then you might feel something that the horse does whether it's, you know, a little spook or to rush or when they lose their balance and then they get a little bit more in the reins than you want, you will start to be aware of what your body does in a response to that naturally. And then you're going to try to talk yourself into breathing through that moment, swinging through that moment and finding your core and not letting that so as get grippy in that moment and it's gonna happen anyway because that's what happens but over time it will happen less and it will happen for less time so when you start to be aware of it stay relaxed don't berate yourself if you make mistakes or you get tight for a couple of steps or even for a lap all the way around, just start to work it out. That's one of the reasons why when I'm working with people on the sitting trot, like learning the sitting trot, I really encourage you to go back and forth between posting and sitting and posting and sitting because when you tell your body, okay, now we have to sit the trot, it goes a little bit into that clamping, I can hold myself still feeling. And that's really not what we wanna be doing. We wanna be moving and swinging with the horse's natural movement. The, the trot 
is, you know, naturally bouncing the back up and letting it down and bouncing it up and letting it down. And if we are sitting still in relation to the wall, then that that's what's going to cause us to be hitting the back because we are sitting still and the horse's back is coming up and coming down and coming up and coming down. So the harder we try to sit still, the more we're going to be bouncing. So I try to think about the posting and the sitting like each other. So I, I want to encourage that same motion that my hips are doing when I'm posting, where I'm opening my hips and then I'm closing the hips. I'm swinging my lower back up and then I'm letting myself back into the saddle. And then I'm going to do that movement uh, slightly on purpose in the beginning when I'm sitting because it's the exact same thing is happening just not as much and if I let myself think like that maybe four or five steps posting four or five steps sitting four or five steps posting four or five steps sitting then my psoas doesn't get a chance to panic and take over because I just, I'm keeping in that rhythm with the posting and the sitting and the posting and the sitting. And on the same way, my horse stays moving and swinging forward a little bit more relaxed. I teach my horse that that's his job to stay the same, whether I'm sitting or posting, they need to stay the same. Because if we sit down and we grip in and then their back gets tight, and holding, that's much harder for us to sit on than a back that's opening and swinging. Okay. So if, and th there's other things that we do unknowingly that also encourage that back to be tight, right? Every time we sit, we ask within the next step for a canter or for a walk. And so the horse always thinks, oh, well, when I feel her seat change like that, I need to do something different. So they don't swing. So I, I also encourage you, even in your warm up, when you start the trot from the walk, sit five or six steps and then start posting. And when you're going to go back to the walk, sit five or six steps and then go post, uh, go to the walk, ask for the transition to the walk. And if I feel in the beginning, when I go to the sitting trot, that my horse doesn't stay the same, I actually might not do the transition. I might go on a circle and go sitting and posting and sitting and posting until the horse accepts it. And then I have the opportunity to ask for the walk instead of the idea that I'm not asking them to go anymore. And that's what asks them to walk. And I want to feel all the time like my seat is connecting the dots between my hands and my legs. So if I'm asking the horse to be more energetic, my seat is allowing for that energy to come through. If I'm asking the horse to, you know, to wait or to slow down, then my seat is going to reflect that by riding a little bit slower. So I'm thinking about that seat as even if my seat is not yet 100% educated, it can still do that job if I'm simply letting it connect the dots between my leg and my seat, uh, my leg and my reins. So if, if I'm feeling um open and moving with the horse and i want my horse to slow down a little bit i use my reins to help the horse to understand to slow down but i'm also going to slow my body down i'm going to post a little slower which might mean i stay up in the air just a hair longer i might stay in the saddle it's it it's almost imperceivable but it's that core strength, a little bit of your lower back, 
feeling control balance that's just saying hey settle into your steps a little bit slow down i can do that with my body language i can do that with my seat if my seat is in flight or fright then it's got that clamping on feeling it's not able to be connecting the dots i'm not able to find that neutral place okay so it you don't have to have 100 percent educated seat in order to start affecting your horse in a good way and just to have some little different habits that are going to help you to develop that seat and part of it is going to be things that you're going to do outside of riding where you notice your bodily reactions also you might find when you're not breathing deep that the shoulders get a little tensed or they might get a little bit up or they might get a little rolled forward and then your hands aren't able to go with the horse's mouth as well if you think about your back and then your shoulder blades your shoulder blades are not attached to your back they actually want to slide a little bit on your back so that it's that slight sliding that is allowing your hands to be steady on the horse's mouth through the movement of your back but if you aren't breathing and then your your shoulders come a little bit up or they come a little bit forward and we start losing that then your horse is going to feel a bit of stiffness in the hand and a lack of swing through your body so that's another really important reason to open up in your ribs and to practice your breathing exercises and if you notice i think we all have things that we do if we're talking to somebody that we don't feel comfortable talking to when we're driving a car and something happens all of a sudden um taking a test in school or doing something difficult at work there's a lot of times that you can pick during your day where you can practice that and think about it because it's going to feel uncomfortable as you change, as you open up, as you start to swing with the horse. It, it Because it's different, your body is going to tell you that it's a little bit uncomfortable. So you need to practice teaching your body, telling your body, it's okay. I'm comfortable doing this. We have good balance. When the balance is down near the saddle, when you've got that center of gravity and you're, you're sitting deep and you're moving with the um, natural motion of the horse, you're going to start to feel more and more secure, actually. But your body is going to tell you that it's not, that doesn't feel good because it's new. Anything that's new, and you, you know it. We talked uh, yesterday, uh, Dana and I talked about it, how we do the same things, you know, in order. Maybe when you get dressed in the morning. You put on your clothes in the same order or the way you wash yourself in the shower. You wash the same parts of your body. You know, the, my, I wash my body first, then my hair, then na, 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 whatever it is that you do. Start changing those things up every once in a while. Use your less dominant, less, less dominant hand for things when you have time for it. All those kind of things where you get yourself out of that control and that knowing that everything has to be the same all the time. And I have to be comfortable with how this feels. I have to know exactly what it's going to feel like. Otherwise, I'm going to be uncomfortable. I can't breathe. I don't feel relaxed in this motion. So we're, you're, we learn, we're going to learn 
what it feels like, those natural four beats in the walk, the two beats in the trot, the three beats in the canter. We're going to learn how to move with the horse that way. But we're also in the beginning have to let ourselves just go with it to find out what it what it what it feels like before we're influencing the horse through it. And it might simply be part of your ride that you let yourself do this. So maybe you you say, okay, I don't have an opportunity for somebody to lunge me, but I'm going to spend five minutes of every beginning of my ride just l letting my horse walk and feeling my body moving with their natural movement. And then as you get into the lesson, you might need to influence the horse a little bit more. But starting off that way, you're already setting the tone for what, how you want your body to respond as your horse is moving naturally. All of the things that we do in dressage are added to the natural movement. It's not some kind of convoluted thing that we're making the horses do. They are moving naturally, and then we're just enhancing it through a little bit of cadence and a little bit of understanding. We move through leg yield or shoulder ends. We're taking a trot, a natural trot, and we're creating a shoulder in with it. But we don't want it to be manufactured and convoluted. We want the horse to be trotting. So our bodies need to be comfortable going with that trot. And then notice when the horse is not moving naturally, encourage them to move from themselves again and continue the movement. And so when we are feeling that the horse starts to make a mistake and they're no longer trotting naturally or cantering naturally, and then our body goes into fight or flight instead of aids that say, hey, hey, come on, you got to keep cantering or you got to keep trotting, then everything starts to get shut down and the horse starts leaning on us a little bit. We start gripping, the air time gets lost, the going over the ground becomes uncomfortable. And then we feel like we can't let go because everything is going to go wrong. And it's got to be that we change that cycle with our re relaxation. And we're going to teach ourselves throughout the day how to breathe deeper, how to open up and relax in our lower back and how to start to train our horses to be trustworthy as well. So when, when you look at this, a number three, having an appropriate horse will help to develop the seat faster and without complications. So as much as we need to do it right, and we need to uh, give them all the opportunities in the world to go right, we have to also ask them to be accountable so that we can ride that way. They're big, they have their own ideas sometimes. And so we need to make sure that the rein and the leg aids are getting the correct responses so that we can go with their movement. So we go with what we like that they're doing. We go with what we are happy with. But if they're doing things that are inappropriate, then we need to curb that. And that would, if it's if it's really inappropriate, that's going to be your safety seat. If it's simply that they go too fast or you know falling here or there, then you're just going to teach them about the leg and the rain aids. Okay, they have to be on basic aids in order for this stuff that we're talking about to really work well for you. I don't want, it's not about giving up control and letting the horse do whatever it wants and you go with it. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about our horses that are in our, uh, 
slight, you know, they're basically under control. And then we are trying to develop our seat with through that. Okay. So does do you guys have any questions? Is there uh, any aspect of this that you want to talk about a little bit more or doesn't make sense? Or does it make a lot of sense? And then we have to figure out how to. It makes a lot of sense to me. I think it just takes a lot of time to sink in like the psoas muscle and the um like that i know i do so the idea of being cognizant of not uh, of you know relaxing the body in the moment is going to take a lot of practice a hundred percent a lot of practice a hundred percent but they, that's no. why how long do we ride every day you know you ride 45 minutes or an hour a day yeah and we, you know, I, I always thought that the only time I could work on my riding was when I was riding. And then all of a sudden I found all these other opportunities, you know, simply how you hold the steering wheel. Now, and Andrea brought it up last time, which was really fun about, you know, how you sit with your hips in the car seat even, right? That you don't let yourself slouch over onto one side because you're pushing on the gas pedal. And, um, you know, a lot of us, you don't drive like granny, you know, you've, you've got one hand on the wheel or whatever. But what if you did sometimes drive with two hands on the wheel and held the wheel how you want to hold the reins and kept your shoulders down instead of up like this? You know, those kind of, you know, little things where you start to teach your body how you want it to behave. So I, I love that. It, does, it is going to, it does take, and I, one, one of the biggest things is the, that I don't want you, once you start to have that awareness, it is going to be like, ah, oh, there I am. I'm doing it again. And, uh, and let, let that go. Awareness is the beginning of fixing it, but don't let it completely disturb your riding that you feel um, that you can't do anything we're just adding this to what you already do we need to build up that relaxation we're, but we're not gonna just feel like we can't even go around the ring now because we're like oh my gosh there it is again now, crystal knows for me that there were certain things that i was doing um not so much last year but the year before you know okay i cannot feel my legs <laughs> i do not know what they're doing so, you know, it, it happens to all of us because I had a horse for years that was um, really responding badly on certain things. And when I would feel anything close to that, it would be like, oh, no. Um, and I had to work hard at getting rid of it. I really had to work hard at it. And it, and it of course, it'll still come up now and then. But I, I it's not from... Uh, not have it's it's because i have experience with this that i think it's really important and i want you guys to think about it and also think about it at home so that it's easier when you go out to clinics or to shows and things like that to start to build up that habit and and help yourselves to feel more comfortable i went with the kids to um you know, big shows to CDIs, to Young Rider Championships. And I mean, they come out of the ring and they're like, I don't know what happened to my horse. He has never been like that before. He never behaved like that before. I don't know why did that happen. But it was really such a lack of understanding of their own bodies and how their bodies were responding to the atmosphere. And there was no preparation for that and i i feel that it's it absolutely is gonna happen it's gonna happen anyway no matter how much you prepare for it because until you get yourself in those situations more and more you don't have opportunity to work on it but when you can think about it a little bit every day what are my what happens if if somebody makes a noise in the barn when i'm riding 
or drop something in the aisle. I mean, here we have such a an aisle that it ricochets the noises so loud through the um, through the arena. And if I was stressed about it and having to tell everybody to, you know, stop working when I'm riding, this then I would get to the shows and it would all escalate, right? Because I'm not controlling myself anymore. I'm trying to control the outside. I can't control the outside. I can only control the inside here. So with the more we practice it, and I'm not saying ride in, in stressful, dangerous situations, but, uh, and be smart, of course, but always think that that's what we're trying to do here is we're trying to control our reactions to the outside. We cannot, you can try as hard as you want, but if you go, I mean, every day things happen, but if you, also if you go to a horse show or something, somebody's going to be slamming the port of John or losing a dog or one horse is going to be crazy or whatever. There's always things happening. So we need to be, how do we respond on that? And how can I keep my horse calm during those situations? And this is a big part of how I do it. And it's worked for me. Um, so I hope that helps. And uh, of course, if you guys have any questions, then you feel free to email me.